Good day. My name is Dr. John Dombrowski. I'd like to talk to you for a few moments about what anesthesiologist assistants are. Just a few words about myself. I'm an anesthesiologist. I currently serve on the board of directors for American Society of Anesthesiology. I currently am the director of communications for the American Society of Anesthesiology. I currently am on the board of, uh, I'm on currently on the pain medicine committee. I was on the economics committee and I was also on the anesthesia care team committee as well as the ASA political action board committee. Please note, I'm speaking only as an individual and for myself. I'm not representing the ASA in any way, shape, or form. I'm not representing the Quad A uh, in any way, shape, or form. This is purely just an anesthesiologist talking to another anesthesiologist in terms of my experience with AAs, in terms of questions I've received over the past 12 years. I've had the pleasure of working with AAs directly or indirectly over the past 10 to 12 years. I've had the opportunity to serve on the anesthesia care team committee for several years. I've also had, had the opportunity for serving on KHIP, which is an accrediting body for anesthesiology assistants education programs. And currently, I just recently uh, accepted the position of medical director of Case Western Reserve's uh, Washington, D.C. campus. Now, over these 12 years, I've had many questions about what is an AA? Why, are, why is the ASA pushing this? Is there something I should be afraid of? as an anesthesiologist? Is this going to be another um, individual we train that's going to uh, hurt us like the uh, anesthesia nurses have like in terms of scope of practice? Are they going to steal jobs from my residents? Um, how do I get AAs uh, into my practice? Um, if they're so good, how come they're limited in only a few you know, states? All these things. So I'd like to take this time to uh, speak to you about what an AA is. Obviously, an AA is a highly skilled paraprofessional that works only with an anesthesiologist. Again, can you imagine that? Anesthesiologists for the first time now have another individual that we choose to work with. For the longest time, many people in medicine, internal medicine, family practice, pediatrics, surgery have had the ability to work with either a PA, a physician's assistant that fall under the board of nursing or a nurse practitioner, or nurse mid midwife, or whatever the case might be, that again fall under the board of nursing. We as anesthesiologists have only had one individual to really work with, and that's been the CRNA, Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist, or an anesthesia nurse. So this is a fairly new concept for the practice of anesthesiology. And we at the ASA, and I personally think this is a very good concept because it embodies the goals of the anesthesia care team. And again, if you're unfamiliar with what the anesthesia care team is, I'd ask you please go to the ASA website, which is asahq.org, and look up the anesthesia care team statement. And it will probably tell you exactly everything I'm speaking uh, with you today. Now, in terms of the, AS, in terms of the uh, AAs, where did this really come from? Well, it started out in the 1960s by three anesthesiologists, uh, Dr. Gravelstein, Dr. Steinhaus, and Dr. Vopolo. These individuals at these uh, two centers, one was at Emory and the other was at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio, realized that there was going to be a shortage of anesthesia providers. And they wanted to set up a mid-level, master's level program to train these individuals to help anesthesiologists. Again, to the same idea of the anesthesia nurse. So how does one become an AA or a nurse anesthetist? Well, for nurse anesthetist, one would take a uh, GRE or MAT, uh, which is an aptitude test, to uh, qualify for nursing school, uh, for the CRNA school. Also to let you know, up into 1998, the majority of nurse anesthetists only had associate's degree, which is a two-year degree, and not a four uh, your bachelor's degree of science. Then after their uh, matriculation, the uh, nurse anesthetist would have a minimum of a 24 months education. They would uh, work in community hospitals as well as some academic hospitals. They would have a minimum of at least 450 hours of classroom, laboratory, and education. A minimum of 800 hours clinical anesthesia education. And a minimum of 450 anesthetics that they would be providing. 
Again, these are ranging all types of anesthetics, where they're MAC cases, spinal cases, regional cases, and general anesthesia cases, like you and I did when we were residents. For the anesthesiologist assistants, their uh, program is a little bit different. Again, these individuals must have completed a four-year degree, so they have a, uh, a BS degree. These individuals also must take, have taken pre-med courses, organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, physics, all the rest of, that, that you know about. These individuals also take MCATs or GREs, but majority of the uh, programs do look at MCATs, and these MCATs are such where they could get into medical school. These are in the mid-30s with respect to their MCAT scores. Now I'm going to stop you right there. You're going to say, well, why aren't these individuals going on to medical school? And that's a very good question. I asked the same question myself. But as you're aware, um, there are a lot of changes right now in medicine, and a lot of these individuals, um, young individuals I've spoken with, uh, really kind of look at the landscape and in terms of what they can make as AAs and what they can make as a physician. And look at all the hours that you and I have, have put in in terms of our medical, medical school training, our residency training, and then coming out to get a job. They've kind of done the math and they realize I did not want to take that burden of uh, medical school loans and lack of ability to make money during my residency to become a uh, physician. So they've opted to become an AA, and, and, um, and that's their choice. Now, some of these AAs uh, like the practice so much, they actually did go back to medical school and become an anesthesiologist, just like some anesthesia nurses have done the same thing. And we currently have Jane Fitch, uh, who sits on our executive uh, committee, who's, who was a past nurse anesthetist. And she, she's a great asset because she realizes um, what she didn't know when she was a nurse anesthetist now that she's a physician. And that's a great statement. Well, the AAs have a minimum of, again, 24 to 28 months of a master's level program. Again, it's a master's of science. They have a minimum of 600 clinical hours and laboratory education. They have a total of 26 hours clinical anesthesia education. And they have a minimum of 600 anesthetics that they've administered. Again, these are MAC cases, uh, regional technique, uh, spinal epidurals, and obviously general cases. Now, once you complete these, there's a, both the certification exam, just like you and I took with the um, ABA boards, et cetera. For the anesthesia nurses, it's, it's done under the Council of, for certification for the anesthesia nurse, nurses. It's an exam from 90 to 160 questions. They have a 40-hour CEUs that are required every two years to recertify. And to be recertified is not required for them to pass any further tests. All they need to do is do their CEUs. Again, the um, board, the anesthesia nurse nurses board, is looking at recertification uh, beginning in 2015. If this measure is adopted, all CRNAs will have passed a recertification exam by 2023. On the uh, corollary, the uh, AAs pass an exam that is provided by the National Board of Medical Examiners. This is what I took, or probably what you took, which are called uh, medical boards. Medical boards part one, two, and three. Uh, they also have to take uh, CMEs, and they have to do, have 40 CMEs every two years, but they are required to have a written examination of every six years in terms of for them to be recertified. Um, now, anesthesiologists after, um, I guess it was uh, 2008, don't quote me on that, we now have to be recertified every 10 years. I was grandfathered in, but I took it voluntarily. Um, but now, uh, for us, we have to be recertified every 10 years. These individuals, it's every six years. So the ASA has had this long uh, relationship with the, uh, with the AAs, as well as, as, well as the uh, nurse anesthetists. We find them as interchangeable parts. We understand we cannot be there for every anesthetic possible. We'd like to have a physician available everywhere. It's just not possible. We're required to be in the OR. We're required to be in the MRI suite. We're required to be in the cath lab, the endoscopy suite, the ERs, office-based anesthesias, ambulatory surgical centers, all these places. It's impossible. So with that, we understand the role of paraprofessionals. Again, the AAs fall under that role. AAs can only work with anesthesiologists. 
Now let me say that again. AAs can only work with an anesthesiologist. They cannot work by themselves. They cannot work with another physician they can, or surgeon. So that is quite unique. And the ASA uh, have always recognized that as a very unique role because we want to maintain that tight clinical responsibility for the care of that patient. And along with that, there's the whole thought of uh, scope of practice. That's always, gonna, that's always a big buzzword right now. Again, AAs fall under the Board of Medicine, just like PAs do. They fall on the Board of Medicine. Who sits on the Board of Medicine? I do, and you do as physicians. The Board of Nursing, which controls uh, nurse midwives or uh, nurse practitioners or anesthesia nurses, we have no say on what they can do at their board. None whatsoever. If the Board of uh, Nursing in the state of Alabama or the state of Iowa or the state of Louisiana wishes to have anesthesia nurses practice pain medicine, we have no role in that. We can take them to court, have amicus brief, litigate this, legislate this, but it's very costly and patients get hurt. But we know it's the right thing to do, but yet we have no say on this matter. Can you believe just recently in the state of South Carolina, the Board of Nursing has approved anesthesia nurses to, to insert and interpret transesophageal echocardiography? Can you believe that? Now, obviously, ASA, as well as a cardiologist, were up in arms about this. Well, this would never happen to an AA because they believe in the anesthesia care team. We always work together. Scope of practice issue, I think, is a bit of a red herring. Now, the other aspect of it is I've heard from my colleagues, my friends from the academic world, that these AAs are going to take jobs from my residents. There's no sense training individuals. They can't get jobs. Well, again, that's impossible. AAs always work under an anesthesiologist. If that anesthesia practice was looking to hire an AA, they're probably looking to change their model in terms of a paraprofessional model anyway. They're not changing it from an all-physician model. They realize times are changing. We might need to change to a paraprofessional model, have AAs as well as AAs. So again, they're not really taking the job whatsoever. Also, when it comes to hiring, um, one needs to consider um, how do I, what's the ratio? How do you do billing and all that? Again, by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Federal Register, AA, AAs are non-physician anesthetic providers. It's, it's in law. You can't get around it. They have to be paid for. Again, with respect to ratios, it's one to two, four to one, whatever your state and whatever your practice you know, will allow you, that is what is doable with respect to AAA. Again, the way I like to think about it, the way the anesthesia care team model is, is these are interchangeable parts. They're not replaceable parts, they're interchangeable parts. You have anesthesiologist assistants, you have nurse anesthetists, they both are, are equally as good, and they both equally get paid for equal work. We believe that is right. Now, when it comes to education, you're going to ask yourself, well, where, where are these people educated? Well, obviously, Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, as well as Emory in Atlanta. But there are a couple other programs. Uh, Case Western Reserve has opened up a, a new program in um, Houston, Texas, as well as one in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's another one in, in uh, Savannah, Georgia, called South. And there's, um, hold on here. Uh, Nova Southeastern, it's in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Nova Southeastern, which is in Tampa, as well as um, University of Missouri, which is in Kansas City, Missouri. All these, all these programs currently are in a medical school format. They also work with, uh, closely with anesthesiologists, always. All these programs must have a board certified anesthesiologist who is their medical director. So again, we are intimately involved in the training of the individuals from their matriculation in terms of taking them into our program, looking at their MCAT scores, interviewing these uh, potential paraprofessionals. We then educate them in terms of helping them learn uh, inorganic chemistry, chemistry in terms of physiology, pharmacology, anesthetic techniques, and then we take them into the um, 
operative setting where then then they are again trained by anesthesiologists or fellow AAs. Again, we are in lockstep with these individuals from their start. The other thing that you're going to ask is, well, if I hire these individuals, what's going to happen to my practice, my anesthesia nurses that I have working with me already? Well, that's always a great question. I've ha heard this for about the past 12 years that I'm going to have a revolt on my hands. Everyone's going to leave. Katie, bar the door. And that just never occurred. Actually, that's, that's an actionable event. You should let the ASA know as well as the Washington office know, and the Quad A know, which is the uh, um, Anesthesiologist Assistance Organization, the FTC, the Federal Trade Committee, would be very interested in that because that's illegal to do that. Every time a new uh, anesthesia department brought in AAs, no one left. And when one or two people did leave, that anesthesia chairperson came to me and said, you know what? I was glad that individual left. They were kind of difficult to work with anyway. And when it came to working with these individuals, the anesthesia nurses were happy to have someone come in, no matter who they were at 3 o'clock, to leave that individual so they could go home. They were happy to have an AA come in and give them a bathroom break, a coffee break, an extra pair of hands to care for that critical patient. When it's all hands on deck, this patient needs the, the best help possible. That's what the anesthesia care team is about. We don't care who you are. We care about the training that you have and you want to work together as a care team for the best care of this particular patient right now under the supervision of an anesthesiologist. That's the bottom line. It's the care of the patient. And so when it comes to a practice, we just really haven't seen this big upheaval. I certainly appreciate that you who are watching this video have a contractual agreement to your hospital. You cannot have your whole staff leaving or threatening to leave. You have a responsibility. I appreciate that, but please note there's little concern that you have. And if you do have concerns, please call the ASA Washington office. Speak to Lisa Albany, who's the state uh, person who can assist you and guide you through this. So if you want to bring AAs into your uh, practice, the first question you have to ask is, how do I do this? And that's a great question. Um, obviously, the first thing you have to understand is, do the AAs have the legal authority to practice inside your state? Then there are two ways of doing this. One is by state legislature, that they have a license to practice, and the other is by a delegatory authority. And this probably is already statute already on the books under the Board of Medicine, and you as a practitioner can delegate your authority to that individual. Now, what is delegation? delegatory authority means. It means that you as a physician remain responsible to the patient at all times and that you assure that the individual performing the task is qualified to do so. And again, we delegate all the time in our clinical practice. Whether we have a medical student start an IV, insert a catheter, a foley, or whatever the case might be, you're readily available. You have the assumption that he or she was trained how to do so appropriately. And if there's a problem, you're there to kind of back that individual up. Again, that's what delegatory authority means. For state licensure, it's a little bit uh, higher bar, obviously. How do you do this? Obviously, you'd want to get uh, your state legislature involved. One or two individuals, hopefully more, both from a Democratic and Republican side, to introduce a bill in your state uh, legislative house. Then it would go to committee for markup, and then it would go to the state body as a whole. Once it passes, then it goes to the governor to be signed into law, and then they can practice. There are many states now that have the ability to practice, and it's currently changing, so I would ask you to go to the Quad A website to see if your state is on that list. Now, if you're unsure about the delegatory authority, again, please seek help through the ASAHQ.org website, or speak to Lisa Albany at the ASA DC office. She can help you uh, with respect to finding out, do you already have delegatory authority on your books? Now, when it comes to licensure, if you want to take that battle up, the ASA will be happy to do so with you, along with your state society. Please let us know early that you're looking to do that. The ASA and Quad A have had several successes. We've had a few failures, and we have learned from these failures. Please learn from us 
how to not commit those same failures, how to get individuals on your team that you're going to need early on to get this passed in terms of who can be your friends and who are your suspected enemies that are against this. And you can imagine there will be a few. And again, obviously, it's the anesthesia nurses. They view this as a threat to their employment. Again, ASA doesn't view it as that. We realize that there's enough cases for everybody. We just want the choice, as an Americans, we have a choice of practitioners. Whether it's a nurse practitioner or a PA, I, as a physician, want that ability to choose. I do not want to be hamstrung to have my choices taken away from me. Again, these are similar individuals. Let us have that ability to practice for the best care of our patients. So if you do wish to go, go that route, please call the ASA early and get the Quad A involved with respect to how to work, uh, it, uh, work your case legislatively. Again, it's lobbying, it's education, it's getting all the ducks in a row so you can have a successful legislature in the future. When it comes to AAs, they work under you, medical supervision. And there was always that case um, in terms of, well, can they do regional anesthesia? Can they paint, uh, place invasive lines? And the answer is yes. But it's what you believe you feel comfortable with or what your hospital says they feel comfortable with or your state that feels comfortable with. They are not malignant with res as perhaps other uh, anesthesia professionals, as they can do it all. They want to work with us. So if you feel comfortable... Uh, them placing in a spinal anesthetic or a, a invasive uh, arterial catheter or central line, that is up to you, the individual practitioner at the bedside, to make that determination. One of your colleagues might feel very comfortable with, the other one may not. That is your choice as a practicing physician. No one can take that away from you. So again, whether it comes to regional anesthetic or invasive lines, they've been trained to do so, but again, it's up to your individual practice to now, who should do that? And again, I would ask you to please look at the ASA anesthesia care team statement on non-invasive lines and regional anesthetics. Again, they, the, the, the uh, Quad A and the AAs, uh, embrace this as, uh, as part of their uh, bylaws. So you have nothing to fear from that perspective. Again, when it comes to hiring, you're going to say, well, geez, what do I pay these individuals? Again, they're the same as an anesthesia nurse. They're not cheaper, they're not more expensive, they're the same. When it comes to ratios or payment, they're the same. Again, I, this is just the start of a conversation. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to call myself, uh, the people at the ASA or the Quad A, so we can help you uh, bring uh, AAs into your practice. Thanks for watching.